Hi guys, Inktus here, and in this video I'm going to be explaining Zone Plus, what it is, what you can do with it, how you can use it, and where you can find out more. This video was sponsored by Nanoblocks, the creators of Zone Plus. To begin, what is Zone Plus? Zone Plus provides an easy and intuitive way of creating dynamic zones for your Roblox experience. Here we can see an example of it being used. So here I am in the Zone Plus playground. You can use zones to track both parts and players. Using the player tracking features, you can create a voting machine. We can also use the player tracking feature to track players as they enter different ambient regions. Zones can also be used to generate parts randomly, which can be useful if you're creating something like a coin system. Zones can also be used to create safe zones. We can also use zones to create regions that act on specific parts that enter them. Here we can see an example of a zone that paints each part that enters it. Now that we have a general understanding of what we can do with Zone Plus, how can we use it? Well, first off, we need to install it. So, starting off at the dev forum post, what we can do is scroll down a little bit to find the Roblox model. Clicking here will take us directly to the model page, and if we want to verify that this is indeed the correct Zone Plus model, we can check the group owner here, and this should be Nanoblox, the group which is owned by Forever HD. Following this, we can head back to Zone Plus and then get the model. And now that we've got it, we can head over directly to Studio to complete the installation. So here I am in a fresh studio window, and what we're going to do to start off with is open up the necessary panes that we're going to be using. So if we head over to the View tab and open up the Explorer window, the Properties window, the Toolbox, and then the Output, we should have something that looks like this. And now in the Toolbox, we want to navigate over to the Inventory section, and then the My Model section, and then Zone Plus should be the first model here because we just grabbed it from the Roblox website. So go ahead and click on Zone Plus here, and then it should be installed directly into the workspace. Now what you want to go ahead and do is drag this over into replicated storage. And now for the sake of this tutorial, I'm going to be writing my code in a local script in SATA player scripts. But if you wanted, you can also make zones on the server and we'll go more into the distinction between those later on in the tutorial. So we're going to go ahead and create a local script within starter player scripts to begin with. Now that we've got our local script set up, we can go ahead and start learning how we create zones. To start off with, let's grab the necessary references to the zone module, the zone controller module, and replicated storage. Now that we've got all of the references set up, we can see that we had to require zone and zone controller because they're both module scripts and we want to get their contents. The first way that we can create zones is by using the from region constructor, which allows us to construct a zone based off of a C frame and a vector 3 size. The C frame here defines both the position and the orientation of the zone. A really quick example of this would be to create a zone centered at the origin, which is at the center of the world, with a size of 100 by 100 by 100. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. So here you can see I've created a zone from a region and I've defined the C-frame center and orientation to be the origin with a default rotation. And then the size is 100 by 100 by 100. And then I've gone ahead and put that zone into a little local variable here that we can use later on. So now that we've got this zone set up, I'm going to give you a visualization of what it actually looks like. So using a quick command line script, I've gone ahead and created a part which is exactly aligned with the zone. This part C frame is set to the origin and its size is set to 100 by 100 by 100. And this is essentially the zone that's created when we run from region with the arguments that we gave it just then. There is an alternative method to creating zones and this method uses containers. Before we use this method, I think it's best if we get an understanding of what containers are and how you can create them. So there are three main types that fall under the big category of container. And the simplest type is just a single base part instance. So here, in my case, I think I'm just going to grab uh, air from within the ambient errors. So this part here. So then we've got a simple container, which is just a single part. Following this, we can also have containers that consist of arrays of parts. So let's say that we now want our container to contain air, earth, fire, and water. Well, then what we can go ahead and do is create an array containing all four of them. 
So there we've got an array container that now contains air, earth, fire and water. So all four of these ambient zones. However, there is a more efficient way of getting zones, especially if they have a shared ancestor. Here, this folder contains all of the ambient areas, and this is an ancestor of all of these parts. Which means that if we wanted, we could also use an ancestor of these base parts to act as a container. So in my case, workspace.ambientAreas would then mean that all four of these ambient areas are now contained within one container. Now that we have a thorough understanding of how containers work, let's go ahead and use one to create a zone around this air part here. So here I've gone ahead and used the new method of the zone module and then passed in an argument which is the container that we want to create the zone around, which in our case is just workspace.ambientareas.air. So that will be this part here, which will mean that we've now created the zone which I've called air zone which will be around that part which I just showed you. Now I've gone ahead and added a couple of print statements so that when we enter this zone it prints out a name and when we exit it it also prints out a name. So you can see from this little test that we've created a zone successfully that wraps the air part as intended. Now that we've covered the creation of zones we can move on to learning about zone events and how we can use them to interact with zones. One way that you could think of zone events are as things that can happen to a zone. So as a first example, let's cover the player entered and player exited events of a zone. So here I've gone ahead and indexed into air zone to get the player entered and player exited signals. Then I've gone ahead and connected to both of these with functions that then let me run code whenever either of these events happens. So here, when a player enters, we get given the player who entered as an argument and the same happens for the player who exited. So I'm going to go ahead and use those to print out a nice message to the output whenever someone enters and exits the air zone. So let's give this a test. Entering the zone now prints out player inctus entered the air zone and when we exit the exited event fires which causes the exited message to be written to the output too. So it's all working as intended. Other pairs of events function similarly to the player entered events. Let's have a look at the part entered events and the part exited events. So all I've done here is indexed into the air zone to get the part entered and part exited events, then connected to both of these events with functions that take in the part that entered and the part that exited. Then I've gone ahead and made a nice print message so that when we enter the zone and exit it, we'll be able to see all of the parts that enter and all of them that exit nicely printed out in the output. Testing this out then, as we enter the zone now, each individual part that enters the zone will trigger an individual firing of the part entered event. The same happens for when we leave the zone. So there you can see I lingered a bit on the boundary of the zone and some parts exited but not all of them had. So this is quite a useful event if you're trying to track individual parts as they enter and exit zones. Having covered the part entered and part exited events then, let's cover a slightly more optimal way of tracking specific parts or characters. In our example here, I'm going to go ahead and track the local player's head. So here, what I've gone ahead and done is got the head of the local player and then use the track item method of the air zone to track the head part here. We can also give the track item method here a character, but in our example, remember, we're tracking just the player's head. Now, when we track specific items, we can use the item entered and item exited events of the air zone. So here, I've gone ahead and indexed into the air zone to get the item entered and item exited signals connected to them with functions that track the item that entered and the item that exited and again bound a nice print message to the output whenever something enters or exits. Let's go ahead and test this out. Since in your experience it's unlikely that you're going to need to know about every single part that enters or exits the zone, it's much more optimal to track specifically the ones that you're interested in. Here we can see that it's functioning as intended with the head firing the item entered and item exited events as it enters and exits the air zone. So far, all of the events that we've discussed have been accessible from both the client and the server. However, there is one set of events, the local player entered and local player exited events, that are only accessible from the client. 
because only the client knows about the local player. These events are useful if you're trying to track just the client that you're on. Let's have a go at using these local player events to track the local player's character then. So what I've done here is indexed into the air zone to find the local player entered and exited signals and connected to them with functions that take in the local player so that we can print out a nice message to say when the local player enters and exits the air zone. Let's see how this looks in studio. So testing it out then, we can see that the local player events only fire when the local player enters and exits zones. This means that if you're making, for example, a region system, it's much more optimal to use the local player events as opposed to the player events, which fire every single time any player enters a zone. Now, using the local player events, I'm gonna go ahead and whip up an example, which will create ambient areas from the ambient areas parts here, which change the lighting depending on what zone we're in. So now, let's give this example a little test. So testing it, we should see that when we walk into the air zone, the ambient now changes to yellow, and then the red zone it goes to red. However, we'll notice that when we leave the yellow zone, but stay in the red zone, the ambient now switches back to the default ambience, which we can see by exiting the red zone. This is not how you want your region system to function. One way that you could solve this is by moving each region so that there's no overlap between them. But realistically, that's quite painful and could take you a long time if you have a complicated region system. Instead, let's have a look at groupings and how you can use setting groups within Zone Plus to get around this problem. Using the Zone Controller, we can go ahead and create Zone Groups, sometimes referred to as Zone Setting Groups, which allow a setting to be applied across a whole group of different zones. And these settings can allow you to do things like make the zone group function as a collective, which is useful when you're working with, for example, region systems and you want your regions to work properly. To fix this example then, let's go ahead and bind all of these zones to a group. I'm going to call this group the ambient areas group. So here we use the bind to group function followed by the string, which is the name of that zone group. Now, once we've bound all of our zones to the zone group that we want to, we can use the zone controller to apply a setting to that whole setting group. This is done using the setGroup method. The first argument here will be the settings group's name. And then following this, we'll have a dictionary of properties that we want to set. In my case, I want to set only entered once exited all to true. What this means is that once we've entered a zone, we have to exit it in order for the next zone to fire the entered event. If we want to test this out then, we can have a look and see how this fixes the problem. Now, testing again, if we enter the yellow zone, we see that the ambient has changed to yellow. But now, when we enter the red zone while still inside the yellow zone, the entered event doesn't fire yet, but only fires when we exit the yellow zone, which is perfect. It means that when we have overlapping zones in our games now, uh, Zone Plus will handle that properly and it will mean that your region system functions as intended and makes all of these groups function as a collective instead of as individual zones. Now that we've finished our region system, let's have a look and see at how we can hide zones, meaning that the player can no longer see the annoying zone parts that we used to construct them. So back in studio, what we're going to do is go for each zone that we create and call relocate. What relocate does is it moves the container that we used to create the zone, in our case the zone part here, and moves it outside of the workspace. Back in the test place now we can no longer see any of the zones that we could see before, but if you go and have a look inside replicated storage we can see that zone plus has created a separate world model and then parented all of the containers that we used to create zones there. So if we highlight the air zone with the move tool we can see that the part is actually over there, so this means that the zone should now be over here. Yep, there we're in the air zone, and then if we walk left, we can see that the fire zone is here, and the earth zone, and finally the water zone, and then we're back out of all of the zones when we walk away from them. So we can use relocate to hide those containers that we used to create zones. So, now that we understand how to use the module, let's go ahead and have a look at accuracy and detection, and how changing these values can let you modify the frequency and precision of zone checks within your experience, therefore allowing you to optimise zones as much as you need. In studio then, we're having a look at the accuracy enum. Here we can see there are four settings with this enum, low, medium, high and precise, and on the right we can see the interval that each setting has between zone checks. 
So with low, you're doing one check a second. Medium, you're doing two checks a second. High, you're doing 10 checks per second. And with precise, you could be mistaken into thinking that you're doing an infinite amount of checks per second. But this is as ridiculous as it sounds. And instead, all we're doing is checking once every heartbeat. Therefore, it's recommended to avoid precise when you're working on the server and instead stick to using it only on the client when you need to. Switching over now to the detection enum, we can see that there's two settings here, whole body and center. Together, they determine the precision of zone checks. This means that if you have a zone that's detecting players and you just want to check if a player enters or exits the zone, you could set the zone precision to be center. By doing this, you reduce the load on the zone because it no longer needs to worry about individual parts within the character entering or exiting a zone. So you use detection to set this precision. Back in the code now, let's say that we want to make all of these ambient zones have a super high frequency. And in order to do that, we'll set it to the highest accuracy setting that we can, which is precise. So there's two ways of doing this. One method uses the set accuracy method of a zone. Set accuracy here takes in a string which corresponds to the name of the enum. We can also set the accuracy using the accuracy property of a zone. So both of these two lines perform the exact same computation. Now let's change the detection of each of these ambient zones to be whole body instead of center. Center is the default value for detection. So let's go ahead and change that using the set detection method. So there, we've gone ahead and changed the detection from center to whole body. Another way to set the detection of a zone is using the enter and exit detection properties, much like the accuracy property here. So here, I've gone ahead and set both enter and exit detection to be whole body. Please be aware that if you set the enter detection to be center and the exit detection to be whole body, what can happen is the center of the character can be positioned within a zone and then one of the parts within that for example, a hand, could exit the zone, thus leading to a rapid triggering of both the entered and exited events. And in order to avoid this, it's best practice to either set detection using the set detection method or set both the enter and exit detections to be the same across all zones in your game. Now that we've finished the tutorial, where can we learn more? If you head over to the dev forum post, you'll be able to use it as a hub to find code snippets, video outlining the different use cases of Zone Plus, as well as links to other important places. So here we have a link to the GitHub repository which contains the source code for Zone Plus. And then here we have the documentation. The documentation is where you'll find an introduction outlining what Zone Plus is, examples on how to use it, how to install it in even more depth than I've given in this video, how it works, and the API, which is basically a list of different methods and properties for zones and the zone controllers. Following this, we also have the Playground, which is a Roblox game that you can edit because it's uncopylocked and used to find out how Zone Plus works with interactive examples for you to test out and get familiar with.